Hello, I'm Bill Hansbury. Um, I'm going to apologise straight out for the quality or the poor quality of this video. Um, it was done on the fly um, and you can see that I'm holding the iPad myself from the wobbles. Um, but I wanted to jump on something that happened this morning and share with you a way that uh, you can share, to young share with young people with dyslexia how their dyslexia affects their memory, uh, their rare call of letters and sounds, uh, in a way that perhaps will help them forgive themselves a bit when they struggle. So I'd like to introduce you to the memory shelf. You know that you're looking at a standard IKEA shelf that's stuck to a wall in my room, but for our purposes today, we're going to call it the memory shelf. And what it's a representation of is working memory. So those of you who know a bit about working memory, you know it's limited. In the non-dyslexic population, uh, the, limit, the working memory, our, our working memory is limited to, they say, seven plus or minus two pieces of information. For our dyslexic community, that's often lower. Um, now this was called Hugh's memory shelf because the idea around the memory shelf was first dealt with with a young person called Hugh. And you can see that this has three to four bits. So if you have a look along the front of our memory shelf, we've got one, two, three, four positions that cards can sit on. And each of those positions represents um, a space or a slot in working memory. So let's just assume we're working with a young person who can only deal with four pieces of information in their working memory at one time. For those of you who understand working memory better than I do, please bear with this really rough and generalised explanation of this. Uh, but I still believe that this works in, in explaining working memory to young people with dyslexia. So four spots on the memory shelf. As soon as we start to jam new things onto the memory shelf, things start to fall off because the memory shelf is only as big as the memory shelf is big. We can't make it any bigger. There's a whole heap of argument about can we do things with working memory to expand it. And the current research says, mm, well, probably not. We can teach young people strategies around chunking and better managing working memory. But really, um, we've got what we've got. So. Here's the context of the conversation with uh, this young student this morning. Uh, I work with a lot of students that I, uh, on a program called Toe by Toe. It's a great program. It's one of the few programs I use with my dyslexic kids. The young fellow, we'll call him Charlie, that I was working with this morning, had got up to the stage in the program where the whole idea of soft G is introduced. The program explains to whoever's working that G in front of the vowels E, I or Y will make the sound J. We call it soft G. So you can have a look at that first word there, uh, which is a non-word, and toe by toe is full of a lot of these non-words because they force young people to decode instead of being able to recognise a word straight away. So this word would be rop jilter. And why is the G making the J sound? Because it's in front of the letter I. So Charlie and I had talked about how when you see a G in front of the letters E, I or Y, it's going to make the sound J. So this was the new concept that we're working with and holding in memory. In front of, the G, in front of an E, an I or a Y, the letter G makes the sound J instead of making the sound G. Now, what you need to know about Charlie and the pages previously that he'd been working on is over the last sections of the book, Charlie had also been introduced to some other graphemes that he had to hold in mind. He'd been practicing the different ways to spell er in words. One of those ways was ur, but he was also having to work with ir and er. He'd been starting to convert the o consonant, o consonant e into his long-term memory, so that became automatic, but it wasn't yet completely automatic. Wasn't getting it every time. Double E making the E sound, and AI making the A sound. When A and I go walking, the A does the talking. So when Charlie came up to this section of toe by toe that dealt with soft G, you have to appreciate that working memory was already occupied with some other new graphemes that hadn't entirely been converted to long-term memory. So you can see the memory shelf was pretty much full. So. Charlie had been going quite nicely on the previous pages, working with these graphemes fairly nicely, and then along comes the idea of soft G. And almost straight away, Charlie was struggling to decode. 
his brain was working so hard on looking at the G and the letter after it, and we were using highlighters and all sorts of things to point his attention to what he needed to look at, that in spending all his memory space on soft G and some other new things, he started forget to forget that things like the double E made E. Um, he started to forget that um, in this one here, which is repjidobe, he forgot that that second E makes an et sound, not an E sound. So the wheels started to fall off in his decoding of these words. You can see the AI there. Uh, he mistook that as the at sound. So we stopped there and I, I said, Charlie, you need to know what's going on in your memory at the moment. So we went to Hugh's memory shelf and I asked Charlie, so over the last few pages of Toe by Toe, what has been you? What, have you, what has your working memory had to deal with? And he identified that, yeah, you are to spell er, uh, O consonant E to spell O, double E to spell E, and A, I to spell A, were new ideas or new things that we were practicing. I said, well, Charlie, look what's just happened. Along has come this other thing to remember about soft G and how it makes the J sound in front of the letters E, I, or Y. And that has to be on your memory shelf as well. So what happens when we try and cram something new onto a memory shelf? Well, sure, it might fit in, but in the process, something else has got to give. Now, AI felt off, fell off of our memory shelf just then, but it could have been anything. And the whole idea was to demonstrate to Charlie that you've only got four spaces, depending on the student, but in this case, you've only got four spaces to deal with. You can only keep four things in mind at once and process them. And you try and jam something in, something falls off. And I explained to Charlie, that's why it seems as though you're forgetting things that you knew before you got to these types of words. So the memory shelf is a really handy way of explaining the limits of working memory and the difference in processing uh, language that you have when you live with dyslexia. It um, helps young people forgive themselves because if you don't understand this type of thing, then it's pretty normal to make the assumption that I've just forgotten because my brain is no good or I'm dumb or I'm stupid. And that's not the conclusion that we want young people to draw. Uh, we can be a bit more scientific about how we explain this. And kids often get it when it's explained this way. So I'll stop it there. I just hope that you've got just another, I guess, tool in your toolbox to help young people with dyslexia understand what's going on when reading is just a struggle and they are forgetting things. Thanks for watching.